A billion people in the world still have no electricity at home. They live off the grid. And every one of those people needs light at night. What do they do now? They burn stuff. They burn kerosene, they burn wood, and that has health effects on them and it costs them money. Of those billion people off the grid, 700 million of them now have cell phones. Holy cow. Holy cow, 700 million people out there with nothing to plug into like we have, and they've got cell phones. There's another 100 million people who live around the world that are like us. They live in cities, they've got the grid, but they go off the grid on purpose for camping, for work, for military, for research. And all of these people are carrying around a little USB plug looking for power. And we live in an astonishing new reality of personal energy security now. Five watts is all you need to run a USB device. It really runs on five volts and one amp, so it's five to 10 watts of power. That's a tiny amount of power. And yet, think about how many people are using it. Five years ago, we didn't have USB, and it's revolutionized the definition of personal energy security for the whole planet. But you still gotta plug it into something. What are you gonna plug it into? Where are you gonna get five watts of power? Well, the first thing people typically say is, well, you get it from solar power if you're out there. Well, solar panels do work, but they're still quite expensive, and if you live in a place that's cloudy, in the far north or the south, if you live under the trees in the rainforest or the jungle, you don't have sun. If you live in India, where people think about solar panels all the time, for several months of the year, it's rain. It's the monsoon. There is no solar panel. There is no solar power. What's the other source of power in nature that we can harvest to get five watts? Well, there's watts of water everywhere. Water is flowing around us, and water, as it flows, as all of you know who have been in it when it's moving fast, has a tremendous amount of energy. Five watts is just to start. But water's coming out of faucets and hoses. It's underneath our canoes as we paddle. It's behind our boats as we sail. It's in the streams and rivers along which we camp and which we live. And in some parts of the world, it's out where we're doing things that are really, really important. And we need that power way beyond the normal need. My background is that my parents are marine biologists. They're a, fam a team. And they raised me on, around, and underwater. And I went into clean technology years ago and worked around the world and ended up doing a study on tidal energy generation from the ocean currents for the city of Tacoma, Washington where there's a huge ocean channel we call the Tacoma Narrows. And the tides go back and forth in that every day and wash back and forth, and they can get very fast. In 2007, I directed a huge study with eight engineering companies how to make big-scale megawatt power with turbines spinning underneath the water in the Tacoma Narrows. And for a year, we looked at everything we could find that's ever been invented and built that would make power from flowing water, big power. The short answer for those of you who live here and know about Tacoma Narrows is, is a bad idea. The tides do go fast once in a while, but not frequently enough. You can't make that much power, and the environmental issues here in our ocean are so serious and so, of such concern that it's just not gonna work. But I became really focused on this issue of where can you make power from flowing water? So I started looking at other sources, and I created a company called Hydrovolts. Hydrovolts now makes small turbines called hydrokinetic turbines that are targeted to irrigation and water supply canals and to big industrial water plants. And each of these turbines makes enough power for one or two American homes, and in a long canal, you can put a lot of them in. I started that company, I raised money for it, I grew it to 11 people, I got three patents filed on new turbines and the company was sold earlier this year. Now during that time, of course, I kept thinking about smaller and smaller turbines. I'm an inventor, I just can't stop doing it. And I came across a funny little thing on the internet when I was looking for turbine technology. I found this little device. This is a turbine that fits in a half inch water pipe that was created by a Chinese company that makes flow meters with remote transmission. 
Because if you're going to measure flow data and you want to send it somewhere, you can't do it with a little power. Punching a radio signal out takes more, more energy. So I found this for sale on the internet. And I thought, well, that's curious. I wonder how much power it'll really make. So I bought one, attached it to the sink in my basement, got it attached to a multimeter, started running the water, and very quickly we were right up at five watts USB power. And we're running only a gallon a minute of water out of the faucet in my basement. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. I mean, I paid $10 for this. And I'm now able to make USB level power off my faucet. Well, that led me to think about how we would turn this into something of a product. And at the time this was happening here in the Seattle area, there's a group called the Social Venture Partners, and they run an annual fast pitch competition for startups. So I thought, I'll apply to this. And I decided to try inventing something. And with my former partner from Hydrovolts, where he was our industrial designer named Dane Roth, I invented a new turbine. Dane and I did it together. Dane was one of the engineers on the Sonicare toothbrush, and he's the lead designer of the Clarisonic skin brush, which many of you might know about. Dane's a wizard at making tiny little motors that work underwater. So Dane and I invented a new turbine, and we call it the Hydro Bee. And we decided to make it in the form of a soda can, because it turns out if you want to send turbines around the world, what's the world's biggest delivery system for a standard size object? It's soda pop. So picking a soda pop can means it can be sent anywhere. Water flows in the top, it spins a rotor, the rotor runs a generator, the rotor, this water runs around the outside of the generator, down through the middle, and then around the outside are six AA rechargeable batteries. We can buy those wholesale for 10 cents each, so 60 cents worth of power. And that's enough to power two USB 3.0 ports. So this can full of juice, when it's charged by water, will run four flip phones, two iPhones, or a tablet, or it'll run an LED lamp all night long. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. So I wrote this up, and I sent it into the Social Venture Partners Fast Pitch Contest application and waited to see what they said. And the first response was, what a bizarre idea. And one of the judges in this we talked about it. He said, well, Bert, this is really curious, but look, I have a house with electricity. I don't need to charge my phone off of my faucet. And if people live off the grid, they don't have faucets either. What are they going to do? So it's not useful to people that have power, and the people that don't have power can't charge it. Well, that sent Dan and I back to the drawing board thinking, now what are we going to do? Well, we thought about the power that's out there in nature flowing around us, the water flowing around us, and we've invented a way to charge this battery using a stream, and we call it the stream bee. So here you have a bottom view and a top view. That can you just saw snaps into the bottom of this little plastic body, which is about this big. And then we attach a little propeller to the back of the turbine to spin the rotor inside of it. Then we tie a string to the front of the body, and we tie that to a tree or a rock or anything, lower it in the stream, and walk away. And you come back in three hours after you're fishing or working or sleeping, and your battery's charged. And you can pick it up, take the can out, and walk away, and you've got a 3.0 battery that'll keep your stuff charged and run your lights all night long. So who cares? Well, remember those billion people I told you about that live off the grid. What percentage of them do you think live near flowing water? It's going to be a lot. We don't really have good stats on it, but we can figure it. So regions of the world where they don't have a lot of solar power, but they got a lot of flowing water and a lot of people who need this. The Amazon, the Congo, all of the rainforests of the world, anywhere it rains a lot and there's a lot of water going downhill. Indonesia, parts of Southeast Asia, lots of places where this can work. So we decided to create a business out of this called Hydrobee, and we filed for a patent to do this. And then, of course, knowing what patents are like, we realized, well, we're going to wait three years to even hear if we can get a patent on this. That's how long it takes now, three years. That's another new reality. Well, we don't want to wait three years. And the other thing is, you can't stop people from copying something like this. It's made out of plastic. The parts are available wholesale on, online. We can't stop competition with a patent. We have to make this better, faster, 
and more cool for the whole world. So what we've decided to do is another thing that is possible with the new reality we live in. We're going to do a global makeathon, a global hackathon, using design software from the Autodesk company, which is used around the world, and my partner Dane is a wizard at Autodesk software. And we're going to invite the world to send us designs, and then we're going to use another new reality. We're going to use 3D printing to make the thing quick. So when somebody says, hey, I've got an idea for a better propeller, we'll say, fine, draw it up on Autodesk and send it to us by email, and we'll print it tonight and test it tomorrow. And if it works better, we'll put your name on the paper. So we can work with the whole planet now to design a better machine. And we're also doing this crowdsourcing, not only to try to raise money and ideas, but to really think about new applications, to get the world helping us invent and that's another thing that we can do now, because the language we can speak in, on the internet in English and with common design software lets people come up with cool ideas. So we've been thinking about the future of this technology and where it's going to go. And one of the things that you got to remember about a USB port, of course, is that it transmits data as well as power. So who has water and needs data about it really badly but cannot get it affordably now? The first group is irrigated agriculture. There's millions of miles of irrigation pipes in the ground around the world. And how do you know if a pipe far away is leaking? Well, one way to tell is that you measure the pressure here and the pressure here, and if there's a difference between them, you've got a leak. But you still have to have a sensor that needs power, and you've got to transmit that data. That needs more power. So a tiny little turbine like this one in a pipe combined with a cell phone and a sensor, and these are getting super cheap, can now be used by farmers to control and measure the water in the pipes. They can measure the pressure, the temperature, the salinity, the flow rate, of course, and that'll help them manage their water use better for agriculture, which is a global concern. You can even do other things. One of the things a farmer told me about just recently, he said, can I run a USB, a USB webcam attached to the phone that'll send me pictures. And I said, sure, but it's your, your pipe's in the middle of a field way the heck out there. Why do you care? He said, number one, I want to know where my animals are. Number two, I want to know who's there that's not supposed to be there. And I said, so why aren't you using solar panels for this, if that's important? He says, because they get stolen within a couple days. That's the whole problem with a solar panel. It's got to be out in the sun. And that means everybody can see it. So irrigated agriculture has a future now with tiny turbines and remote transmission that we can start making a big impact on water conservation in agriculture. The other big community of people that can use this with a similar problem are the owners and managers of apartment buildings. How many people in the world do you think now live in apartments? It's in the billions at this point, in the great cities and small cities of the world. And one characteristic of apartment buildings is they have exactly one meter for water per building, just like your house does. And that means that inside the apartment buildings, you don't know who's using how much water there is, and there's no incentive for anybody in an apartment building to save water because they don't have any data and they don't pay for it. The last mile in urban water conservation is the distance from that meter to the bathroom. And we don't know what happens there in an apartment building. I'll give you a quick example of why that's important. A friend of mine runs apartment buildings here in Seattle. He told me one of the buildings had a huge overuse of water. It was way off the charts. They didn't know why. They had to do an apartment by apartment investigation. They discovered there's a lady who, when she goes to work in the morning, has a cat. The cat doesn't like to eat off the floor, so she leaves the water running in the sink all day for the kitty. Off the charts water use. Now, this device can fit in a pipe, just like you see. It can have a little cheap cell phone, and it can be telling us what's going on in every apartment building now. That means that we can start getting data to promote water conservation and billing to billions of people. The last mile of water conservation in cities depends on having data and giving financial incentives to people to respond to it. But they can't do it if they don't have an affordable meter. Well, a cheap cell phone now, wholesale, three, four dollars. Cheap turbine, a couple dollars. Put it into the design, and now you have something that every green building advocate in the world is going to want to put into their system. 
because now you can have smart plumbing that talks to you. So we're going to be developing a cell phone app that will take this data so you'll be able to look at your phone, see what your water use is. And there's even enough power coming out of one of these things to operate a shutoff valve. So you should be able to shut off your water if it's not doing what you want, like it's running when it's not supposed to because you got a leak. When we think about the future of personal energy security, it's a new reality where the amount of power we need has gone to the tiniest level, five volts. Who would have thought it? Five years ago, this made no sense. And throughout the history of us trying to get energy out of nature, from the beginning of hydropower, no one in the world ever bothered messing around with a five-watt target. What was the point? You can't do anything with five watts. But now you can. Now you can run 10 billion devices that are critical to people's personal energy security for lights and phones. You can even disinfect water now with a USB sterilizer. So you can get clean water off of a USB port now. So our vision is that you'll go out of here looking at nature a different way from now on. You'll be thinking, I see the wind blowing, I see the water flowing, and you'll think, huh, if I don't have electricity, how am I going to harvest that? And I hope that this talk will inspire 100,000 high school science fair projects because it's the perfect thing. The pieces are cheap, they're widely available, five watts is not a big target to hit. Let's all try to encourage the kids out there to realize they can learn more about energy and their personal energy security and also invent new ways to harvest power from water that we can all use. Thank you.